Um, thank you all. So this is the uh, the third and uh, last meeting of uh, this very uh, brief survey. Oh, I see this is the door to my room to the room closed. Yes. Um, so this is the last meeting in this this very cursory, very brief survey we're doing of some of Rep Cook's ideas on uh, teshuva. We've traced, um, you know, we sort of talked about how teshuva, like so many things is part of a conceptual vocabulary that that uh, thinkers and plain old Jews uh, work with and revise over time. Um, and we've seen how Rav Cook uh, takes a cluster of Kabbalistic ideas um, associated with tshuva, with, um, which is tshuva associated with sort of the place and the divine structure of the world and the world of the spirit. Um, Chuva as the place to which one returns, as so to speak, a return to one's own spiritual womb um, and a place of great freedom, right? A place of returning to most truly being oneself. Um, and there's, you know, the, the, in the womb, there's a kind of what freedom is that you're not necessarily choosing a whole lot of stuff in the womb, but your life has been, so to speak, undetermined. Right? There's still great possibilities and all the possibilities and potentialities that you have are there. And, and so one of, one of Rav Cook's great conceptual innovations here is talking about freedom. The idea of identifying um, tshuva with the sfira bina and bina with chirut and yobel, right? Sort of the freedom of the jubilee year, right? The time when all the slaves go free and land is restored to its uh, rightful owners. Um, so he didn't originate that, right? But it's the uses which he make, makes of it, and as you've probably observed by now, the sort of very dramatic lyrical uh, language with which he expresses these ideas, but it's, an, it's lyrical and it's poetic, but it's also a lot of ideas, and it's one that resonates with distinctively modern notions of freedom, of selfhood, of subjectivity, of the truth being something that I discover within myself, and also, as we've started to see, one of Herb Cook's uh, great innovations as a thinker is taking um, Kabbalistic ideas and, and categories and using them as, as ways of understanding and making sense of uh, concrete social and political movements and things like nationalism and social justice movements and widespread rebellion against uh, 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 traditional uh, rabbinic authority. And we're going to see some of that here as well. So, but first, when we talk about, and also, and one, one last bit of thing we're going, another thing we're going to see is, is but doesn't, but doesn't, doesn't Chuba have to do with like stopping, like to be sinful and to like repent of one's sins, right? You know, sort of in, in the midst, in midst of all this like wonderful, Kabbalistic, mystical, romantic, poetic, Shavar Marai, like, you know, whatever he can, whatever happened to like regretting one's sins and trying to be better and forgiveness and all of that. And we're going to see he talks about that too. But he has this interesting definition of what is sin, this different, 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 different understanding of what is sin and what is forgiveness. So now, um, in our very first meeting, I forget which one of you uh, raised this issue, um, but, but one of you very perceptively from the beginning, when as soon as I said, um, you know, the Rav Kook talks about freedom. Uh, some one of you said um, asked, "Well, does he mean negative freedom or positive freedom?" And I said, "That's exactly uh, the question, and it will be getting back to it." So we finally are. Um, I hope you can see the screen. So the first quote is not from Rav Kook, not from the Kabbalah, not from anything, but it's from an encyclopedia article uh, from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which is available online, um, and. It discusses this idea of what is liberty, what is freedom. And um, this is just an, an excerpt from it, but there's an idea that has uh, been about in, uh, in, 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 among philosophers for several decades now, first introduced as we'll see by Isaiah Berlin. That when we talk about the word freedom, we tend to use it in several different senses. And a key distinction is what is, is, is what has come to be known as the distinction between positive liberty and negative liberty. Okay, so let's, um, let's read from the encyclopedia entry here. 
Negative liberty is the absence of obstacles, barriers, or constraints. One has negative liberty to the extent that actions are available to one in this negative sense, right? There's things I want to do, and there's no external barrier standing in my way, right? There's nobody saying, don't do that, right? There's no um, institution or there's no object or there's no institution stopping me from doing what I want, right? I have a sense of what I want. I have an ability to do what I want, an innate ability to do what I want, and there's nothing sort of like getting in the way. But positive liberty is the possibility of acting or the fact of acting in such a way as to take control of one's life and realize one's fundamental purposes. Right? While negative liberty is usually attributed to individual agents, though it doesn't have to be, I would add, positive liberty is sometimes attributed to collectivities or to individuals considered primarily as members of given collectivities. This is a somewhat abstract way of putting the observation that when especially nationalist movements talk about achieving freedom, they're not just talking about um, removing restraints. They're talking about achieving some idea of themselves, that that's true for people and that's true for people as individuals and it's true for groups, right? Um, and if you all just think about, think for a moment about this term, um, self-determination, right? Um, self-determination is this term that we all use, and um, it's this sort of very common in international relations. Zionism, just take one example, is often referred to as the, you know, the self-determination movement of the Jewish people, the Jewish people's right to self-determination. Conversely, you know, other national groups, be they Palestinians or, you know, or people in Northern Ireland or whomever, right, all talk about realizing self-determination. So when, when people talk about self-determination, um, they, they mean, of course, you know, yes, those sort of getting to run their own affairs, um, not being told by others, you know, not being stopped from doing what they want to do, but what is it that they want to do? And also to determine oneself means to give oneself shape, to give oneself a sense, to sort of to decide for oneself what it is that you want to do, right? And that is more than somebody just not stopping you. From doing something. That's more of you being able to achieve something, right? Um, let's continue in this encyclopedia entry. In the famous essay first published in 1958, Isaiah Berlin called these two concepts of liberty negative and positive, respectively. The reason for using these, la using these labels is that in the first case, liberty seems to be a mere absence of something, i.e. of obstacles, barriers, constraints, or interference from others. Whereas in the second case, it seems to require the presence of something, of control, self-mastery, self-determination, self-realization, right? Positive liberty is very much something that I feel within, right? In myself, I am free. In myself, because I am free, I truly can be myself, right? Um, one example, um, that I, that, 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 uh, comes to mind for me. Um, I remember some years ago seeing a documentary on PBS about, um, about, uh, the hymn Amazing Grace, right? Um, about, um, about the hymn um, Amaz Amazing Grace. And, um, and at one point Johnny Cash was interviewed. And Johnny Cash said, you know, and Johnny Cash knew a thing or two about being in prison, and he knew a thing or two about, you know, falling apart in one's life and needing God's grace to restore yourself and so forth. And Johnny Cash said, when I, you know, when I sing Amazing Grace, you know, I could be covered in chains, but I sing that song and I'm free as a bird. So I think that that comment of his really puts into very stark relief what we're talking about. That negative freedom means nobody's putting chains on you. Right, you can, you can move around. But positive freedom means the way you can feel free and unconstrained and truly yourself and in touch with your best self as a human being, even when you're 
being constrained. Um, one person in the chat asked if positive and negative liberty is a way of thinking in terms of Shabbat, like Shamor and Zahor. And that's actually a beautiful, that's actually a beautiful analogy. Um, you know, Shamor, like the mitzvot lotah, say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And, and Zahor, sort of remembery, uh, remember, remembery, for those of you who've seen uh, or the, the finding Dory movie, uh, memory, uh, or to remember the Shabbat, right? Affirmatively to do something, and yes, uh, Suzanne Eleven points out not to understand an example of this. That's a wonderful example, right? People who are in deep are in prison, um, and 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 uh, so now Mona Fishbane says, I don't think you can have positive liberty or self determination if you're in chains. Okay, you can't have self. You can't achieve self determination, right? But the question is, can you feel free inside? Right? There's some sense in which perhaps you can free inside. You know, a, a key statement of positive liberty in the modern world is, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his book, The Social Contract, when he, the opening line is, you know, man is born free everywhere and is everywhere in chains. Right? So the freedom is within and the chains are a society. You see, there's elements of this Rousseauian type thinking in Rufko for better or worse. Now, so because also to clarify, um, to clarify, when, um, okay, so now also just sharing this wonderful quote from Viktor Frankl, reflecting on his experiences in Auschwitz, the space between, there's a space between stimulus and response. We have some choice, but the chains limit our choice and options. Um, true. Um, I wouldn't presume to speak for Viktor Frankl, but remembering his book when he talks about how in the concentration camp, in his mind, he would sort of be having these conversations with his wife, right? Um, at that point, you know, was, that was his way of achieving some kind of freedom that obviously wasn't, that wasn't constrained, right? But, it's, but here it's also freedom as a kind of, this also relates to things we talked about, I believe Elias Rupp Cook and their turn to nature, right? Freedom as being true to oneself. Right. Freedom as being true to oneself. Now, what does all of this have to do with Chuba? So, um, let's get back to some of these texts here. You know, just in the interest of time, I'll be reading the English, but you have the Hebrew. The will, the Ratzon which derives from the power of Chuba, is the deep will of the depth of life. Not the superficial will, which grasps only the weak and external sides of life, but rather the will, which is the innermost nucleus of the foundation of life and its very heart of the soul. Rev. Cook, like many Kabbalists, talks a great deal about the will. And um, in certain schools of thought in the Kabbalah, the will is essential, is, is that's where creation begins, right? When God, the Ain Sof, emanates outward into and sort of creates the dimensions of time and space, the first thing that emerges is the divine will, because there is a divine will to emanate out of infinity into finitude, to create finitude, right? Uh, I mean, we could go into more detail about this and how it plays out in all sorts of ways in the Kabbalah. First, it's a little arresting, it's a little strange what the will is like this. And so you realize the will here is um, being understood as this fundamental force of life. Kind of, you know, what, what the philosopher Henri Bergson calls the elan vital. There's a lot of similarities between Rufkuk and Bergson. Right? The elan vital, sort of this fundamental will to live. And in God's case, this fundamental will to give, right? Um, it, you know, sort of as in, 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 in for the Ramchal, who's very important for Rav Kook. Ramchal is, is one of the people from whom Rav Kook gets very much of his teachings about the will. And Ramchal is like, why does God want all this? Because God wants to do good. God wants there to be creatures with whom he can do good. Right? God wants to share a bit of his infinity with others. That sort of thing. And so Chuva, and again, this is also where Rav Kook does not sound like your stereotypical Musr schmoozing Rashi Shiva. key step in doing chuvah 
is not about weakening your will when we say, you know, is, but it's strengthening your will. It's, it's smelting your will. It's purifying your will so that your will actually functions, right? Because the, the ultimate for him and, and is that he wants to get away. Okay. He wants to get away from a sense of the will that's fundamentally neurotic. Right? Think of your archetypal Woody Allen character, tearing himself to pieces with choosing. Right? Um, or the archetypal Nebish are sort of these characters out of Philip Roth, right? These sort of very archetypal American Jews who are just like tearing themselves to pieces over having to choose. And to Rav Cook, and you sense that there's echoes of Nietzsche here, you're not wrong. Um, that's fundamentally sick. Right? There's something fundamentally ill about someone who's constantly doubting themselves, constantly undercutting themselves, constantly doubting their own ability to do good in the world, constantly not having faith in themselves in a very deep way. Now, he's not against introspection, of course, but the goal of this is to liberate the good that is within you. Again, because ideally, as I've said, for a cook, the goal is for a person to do the good as naturally as you eat or breathe, right? Without you know, not to break yourself to do something good, but rather to train yourself to want the good in a very fundamental way, the same way you want to be healthy, right? In that's why if you take a look in, is, you know, you notice that this, this text comes from um, Orod HaTshuva. Orod HaTshuva is an actual treatise that Rav Kook wrote on Tshuva. Most of Orod HaTshuva, it's like, it's, it's the first three chapters work sort of like a treatise, and, but most of Orod HaTshuva is different notebook selections of his, like the ones we're looking at, and you'll see a number of them that we're going to look at today also appear in, in a road that we'll put there, edited, you know, by his son of Tsuyuda. Um, but in the early chapters, where of Cook sort of tries to lay out a more systematic way of looking at Chuva, one of the first things he talks about is Chuva TV. Chuva TV, natural Chuva. What's natural Chuva? Because like working with your own wanting something good, your own wanting your good, your own, your, the goodness that's inside of you and the ways in which when you're doing the good, you feel good, right? Even at a very, at a very basic level. Now, moving forward, the kinds of inner freedom that Rav Koch saw. This is just another remarkable passage from one of his, from one of his diaries. Expanses, expanses, my soul craves divine expanses. Don't fence me into any cage, corporeal or spiritual. My soul flies in heavenly expanses. The heart's walls can't contain it. Neither the walls of action, morals, logic, or manners. Above it all, she soars and flies. Above all that can be called by any name, beyond all pleasure, all grace, and beauty. Above every exalted and noble, atzili, noble or emanated thing. I am sick with love. Now, um, this is the What's interesting here, I mean, this is like, like often in his journals. This is a record of a remarkable religious experience right? of, of a desire for a kind of expansiveness for drinking deep of the well of the world, of being at one with the world in a way that dissolves all sorts of familiar boundaries. Now, what's interesting here is that also, and, and this is throughout, these, there's a whole cluster of passages like this in this particular notebook, in Shmonach Kvatsim, notebook, uh, Kovetz Gimel, is that it's very clear that Rav Kook is reflecting on his own religious experiences, but he also has always has the Kabbalah in mind. In the Kabbalah, um, the first person singular, Ani, is a synonym for the Shekhinah. In the Kabbalah, as we've said, like the Shekhinah, has, has many um, synonyms in the Kabbalah. The Shekhinah, the divine presence in the world, is, is synonymous with um, the Torah Shabbal Peh, with Eretz Yisrael, with Knesset Yisrael, um, the sacred community of Israel, and also with the first, with the first person singular pronoun, I mean, I, right? Um, and and so there's something about the lone individual, which is reflective of God's aloneness in the world, right? 
and God's and God makes oneself present as the individual makes themselves present, and and in the same way, sort of like that, this idea that that divinity can't be contained by this world, right? When Rav Cook talks about morals here, Musar, because I've thought about this passage for a long time, he doesn't he doesn't say like I want to be unethical and I want to go out and like start slaughtering people, etc. But this is one of the times when he uses Musar. Often he, I mean, he discusses Musar at great length. My teacher, Rav Amital, pointed out that Musar is the one word that appears more in his corpus than anywhere else. There's another very famous passage in, in, in Shona Kratzim, also appears in the Rota Kodesh, where a cook lists something like 20 different meanings of the word Musar for him. But here, I think what he means is, um, again, like, like morals, ethics in, in its narrow sense, or what I called earlier, its neurotic sense, right? Sort of like this. You know, that like when you're not, when you're acting not out of a sense of like wanting to do the good, but should I do this, should I do that? Okay, that seems the better thing to do. He wants to somehow get away from that, get beyond that. Right? And why? Because I am sick with love, and he's obviously sick, sick with love for God, right? Also, the ani, the I, is sick with love. The shechina is, so to speak, sick with love because the shechina is God. So, so and these are also the ways not to sound sort of too narrowly sociological or ideological, but um, it's moments like this, I feel know what I mean when I say like it's very hard to read Rav Cook in to like to slot him as a conventional. So is he orthodox or not orthodox? Like this is. You see, like he's breaking, he's he's fracturing these. Not that these categories necessarily work, but these sorts of obvious categories don't seem to work here for him, right? You know, because also, like, is this how an orthodox, a quote unquote, orthodox rabbi talks, right? He's not interested in that. He's interested in this extremely living, vital sense of of Torah. Okay. Now, so what is sin? in all of this. There's no such thing as sin. No, there is sin. Right. Sin is what gets in the way. Right? Rav Kook has this fundamentally idealistic, optimistic view of the human condition. And sin and the mitzvot are there, as far as he's concerned, to liberate us. Right? They are, they are to, to, to move you towards your best self. Right? They are, are moved, they, move, they are meant to unleash your will. They're meant to unleash your goodness. They're meant, as we've said, Rav Kook sees Tameh and Mitzvot sort of prospectively, right? Unlike the Rambam, who views Tameh and Mitzvot, the enterprise for finding rationales for the commandments, for seemingly, you know, for commandments that are hard to understand. Whereas Maimonides tends to look backward, right? And say, well, during the time when people were, you know, worshiping idols, so that's why this or that practice, you know, like, Offering sac animal sacrifices like this, or keeping chapmid or that made sense. Um, Rav, Kook, Rav Kook shares the view of the Rambam and Sadia and the Meiri and others that there are no commandments in the Torah that are purely ira irrational, right? That God, you know, as Chazal put it, in Kadosh Baruch Hu Babitzrom Ya'im Briotav, God does not act tyrannically with his creatures, right? God doesn't just like give you a mitzvot to say limbo. Okay, now everybody limbo. I jump now, everybody's supposed to say how high. There's always reasons for the mitzvot, right? But he sees reasons prospectively. The mitzvot are trying to educate us towards a higher ethic in the future, when indeed, he sometimes writes, the ethics that, 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 that when in, by, by the standards of that, you know, contemporary halachic ethics may indeed seem deficient. Right? Vegetarianism is the most obvious example. So what is sin? Sin is what gets in the way. Sin is what gets in the way of your fundamentally wanting to do good. Every sin grieves the heart. Why? Because it contradicts the unity of the individual personality with all of being. Right? Sin is what keeps us from connecting with the world and connecting with other people and connecting most deeply with ourselves and us with God. That's why sin hurts. That's why sin is painful in and of itself. Right? And it heals only through tshuva, which shines onto it, onto the heart. And it's in this, um, in, 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 for this whole passage, take from this quote from Sagmet. It shines onto the heart, a light of the heavenly flow of 
idealism or idealness, which constitutes reality. And with that, there returns the broad equanimity and proper fit to the being which is manifest in it. And he quotes the verse in Shayao, Bashab Rafalo, and he returns and healing comes to him. So remember, as I said, like Rip Cook is very idealist. He's both, he's an idealist at heart. Um, again, he has this very idealistic view of human condition. He's also an idealist in the philosophical sense that the world is fundamentally about ideas working themselves out through history. And again, as I've, as I've said, a very deft philosophical move of his is that he takes this I word ideas, this concept of ideas and ideals, ideals both understood as human aspirations, human moral, cultural, social aspirations to make the world better. Ideals as the idea of sort of like the large concepts and categories that structure that through which our minds come to understand the world and through which we function. And he identifies that with the Spiro such that human idealism in terms of wanting to make the world a better place, human idealism in terms of trying to understand the world is God's presence in the world. It's how God is working through the world. And so coming to understand oneself like and really living one's ideals and really inhabiting one's ideas is a deep form of tshuva. Also, you've noticed just this stylistic very characteristic of Rafa's writing, the Shabra at the end of these very expansive theological, mystical, etc. musings, he often cites a single passage or a line from the Shadur. On the one hand, it's a very, um, it's a sort of lyrical, uh, poetic touch, but there's also a theological doctrine behind it. Because uh, remember, as we said, Rafa is a disciple of the, of the Vilna Gaon. And a key teaching of uh, the Vilna Gons is that all of the Torah, all, all, of, all of Revelation, all the Torah, all the Kabbalah, um, is rooted in its divine source, which means that in halachic terms, the machlokot, the differences of opinions among the medieval commentators, the Rishonim, are ultimately traceable to passages in the Talmud, right? And disagreements in the Talmud are ultimately traceable to the Mishnah, and disagreements in the Mishnah are ultimately traceable to the Bible itself, right? To ambiguities in the biblical text or different biblical texts going in different directions. The idea here is it's put lachzir. This isn't just like a clever bit of reconstruction. The theological idea is lachzir called davar l'shor right? Everything should, must be returned to its source in divinity. So ideas also so like, because God's revelation, right? So also because the sense like the tshuva in a deep way, I and mean, this is also Rav Cook talking, right? The tshuva is this force pulsing through the universe. Torah is a force pulsing through the universe. And just the same way the blood circulates, it returns, right? So part of the study of Torah is to relax here, kol davar l'shor show. And when you do that in your Torah study, when you manage to like, really, that's part of why the Vilna Gaon places such emphasis on Torah studies, the supreme religious act, that is how you connect with the divine mind. And you connect, you sort of return to the revelation at Sinai by taking the most, the farthest, the most developed ideas in halakha, or in this case, mystical theology, and rooting them in the biblical text is a way of you getting back to that revelatory moment yourself, right? If, you know, sometimes it occurs to me, you know, the, the, the way the Bill Go looks at things, if, um, risk of sounding a little flip, if Virginia Woolf had this famous essay, A Room of One's Own, where Cook sees Torah study as creating a Sinai of one's own, right? Every time you learn Torah, and especially if you do it by, with an awareness, which is where Bill Gones method is concerned, of tracing everything back to scripture, you are once again at, at Sinai. Um, I just, I see there's uh, some questions in the chat and I wouldn't want to, ah, Yes, this is at the center. Someone pointed out, um, Irene Lancaster pointed out um, that this is at the center of Ibn Gabirol's Keter Malchut. Irene, would you mind just saying explicitly what you, what, what, what you find at the center of? I, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, well, I'll just say Ibn Gabirol's magnificent poem, Keter Malchut, is indeed a crucial source. It's one of the crucial sources for uh, the introduction of Neoplatonic ideas um, into, into it's, it's a major. Like a celebration. What? We have 
I've done a lot of work on Jewish philosophy. I love your stuff and I'm teaching your book. Well, that's, well, that's it's kind of you to say, but it's neither here nor there. Yeah. Right. The point so, is, uh, I, I translated Ketam al which I think ah. is used by the Saudi uh, community, yes, in a book for Routledge on um, actually uh, Jews under Islam um, because they've been ah, lovely. In Yeah, so I, I have just actually been teaching clergy um, about Psalms. And I mentioned how we, the Jews, tend to think of going from God, you know, person to God and God to person. And I, mm -hmm. I quoted this, you know, my translation of will and wisdom. Um, and these were very concepts. I think he was extremely um, pioneering Ibn Gabirol. It's not to detract from Rav Cook, of right. course. Oh, no, no, but, I mean, but, Rav, but actually... Rav Cook is standing in Rav Cook's intellectual lineage. Of course, yeah, those exactly, yeah, exactly. To, to, and I was the person last and... time. I hope you don't think I was rude. The the person no, 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 last no, 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 no. progressive um, uh, about women <laughs> because the, um, you the, know was... the British on that. Right. Not um, the... Thank you. Um, so because yeah. because because also for I mean part of what Ibn Birol's poem Ketra yeah. Mahud is is also yeah. very much about this idea of the universe mm. as this. Mm. Of Right. Absolutely. First is a side yeah. longing of a human desire to return to God and be one with God. And that's, that's very right. important absolutely. what, what yeah, is, absolutely. is working on here. So now at this point, I'd like um, to, to and keep moving through the text as he's working through this idea of what is sin. And here he states very explicitly. Sin. Oh, Yehuda. Yes. Again, okay. I got a, a couple people comment. That's usually fine, but once in a while your voice fades in and out, meaning okay. sometimes you get right. too far from the mic. So just talk nice and loud. Like, like I'll talk nice and loud. I know my, my daughters, when I teach, they say, you know, Abba's screaming at the computer. So, <laughs> okay. Um, Go sin, ahead. What is Go sin? Okay. sin for Rav Cook, right? Sin is like, imagine there's a light. Imagine there's a streaming light and something then like blocks it up, right? Sin is an opacity that blocks the light. Sin blocks, and here we are, sin, sin blocks the illumination of the higher wisdom. Now again, chokhmah in Kabbalah doesn't just mean being wise. Chokhmah is, is keter chokhmah bina, it's one of the very highest spirot, right? And in, in, in the Kabbalah, and certainly in the Kabbalah of the, of the Vilna Gon, Right, Chokhmah is the fount of revelation. Sin blocks the illumination of the higher wisdom, whose revelatory path proceeds through the simple harmony of the soul, which understands the wholeness of all being and its heavenly source. Every practical sin, every sin, concre every concrete sin, rips this ideal unity, places the circle of life outside of it. And the manifestation, which trickles out like a clear fountain, no longer flows to that hallowed, hallowed, will, to be hallowed will, until he returns and regrets. And the light of tshuva, in proportion to the clarity of understanding and the depth of information, will restore that harmony to its former strength. Oh, return to me the joy of your deliverance, and a generous spirit sustain me. Right? Hashiva lisa soni shecha ruach nudivecha nuru ruach nudivat sanctaini. So, in practical terms, think about the moment when you're like, I don't know, think about a moment when you were doing a mitzvah and it was all coming together. So, when I think about this, the association that comes to me is like a time, say, saying kiddush on Friday night. Lighting Shabbat candles on Friday night. And this moment when you're feeling peace and calm and you're doing it just right, and it's like the choreography of the mitzvah is coming together and it's just beautiful. And then imagine you mess that up. <laughs> imagine you mess it up. Imagine, like, I, you know, like, like, imagine, like, I'm standing around, I'm standing there at the Shabbos table, I'm saying Kiddush for my family, and, you know, all of a sudden I, you know, reach out and, like, turn the light on, or turn the light on. I shatter the moment. It hurts. It feels bad. You are achieving something. There was something coming together. There was something harmonious, right? Imagine, like, sometime when you were doing a mitzvah, and then you find, you're doing a mitzvah with someone, and then you find out, like, you know, like, imagine you're doing a mitzvah with somebody, 
and and you know like imagine i'm going to like make a make a minion for someone and there's and like there's me and somebody else and like we're struggling it's it's like hard for us to get to minion and but the other guy is really is 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 really doing it and i'm only doing it you know to spite somebody else right or whatever think about these times when like through mitzvot and also just in our lives like something is going well things are going nicely you're behaving well you're behaving like you've got a good thing going you've caught the wave and sin stops it smashes it it gets in the way the regret the re so like the regret that you feel because regret is something that one is supposed to feel it's a necessary step in tshuva Rav Cook here is this so often and remember we said over and over again for Rav Cook he's like urging you to take your inner life seriously your regret about something the pain that you feel about your spiritual alienation is is a thing it's something in the world right the regret that you feel is real it's it's connected to so to speak like a, a divine energy in the world which also like feels bad when it's stifled and so and again, he's reconceptualizing what mitzvot are by reconceptualizing what sin is, right? As far as he's concerned, there's goodness all around. There's divine light all around. Mitzvot are there to sort of walk you through. One way of looking at mitzvot, they're a way to like walk you through and guide you to unleashing the good that's in yourself and in the world. And sin blocks them. And here... One of the most remarkable, pa I think, one of the most remarkable passages in this writing. I'll read it first in Hebrew. Adam hakoev tamid al avonotav avonot haolam. Tzarichu tamid limchol v'lisloach la'atzmo v'lolam v'lolam. V'vazeh humamshich slicha v'or chesed al havaya kula. M'sameach l'makom, m'sameach l'makom. ומתחילה <laughs> One who grieves constantly for his sins and the sins of the world must constantly forgive and absolve himself from the whole world. And in so doing, he draws forgiveness and a light of loving kindness unto all of being and brings joy to God and his creatures. And he must first forgive himself and afterwards cast a broad forgiveness over all, the nearest to him first, on the branches of the roots of the soul and on his family, his loved ones, his generation, in his world and all worlds. And thus is, it says thus, but should be thus is revealed all the good that is hidden away in everything. And he attains the blessing of Abraham. There is not, of whom there is not one generation in which his likeness does not emerge. So he's again describing a remarkable experience here. And it doesn't it's not like a kind of easy forgiving oneself because who's he saying this to? Notice who this is addressed to one who grieves constantly for his sins and the sins of the world, right? Sort of if you are constantly, you know, it start like how do we deal with a deep awareness of sin? And sometimes it seems insuperable. So somehow you have to forgive. And somehow you have to forgive yourself and you have to forgive the world. And what's right, the, the process that he describes here, it's a kind of like concentric circles of forgiveness. It's almost like, you know, the image, it's like, it's like a pebble dropped into a pond and it's rippling out. Or it's sort of these, the way I often think of it is like these great exhalations. By the way, breathing, of course, is, you know, it's no accident, right, that God, at God, when God is described as merciful, God is described as, you know, erech just mean like God has a long face, right? It means that God takes deep breaths, right? Sort of, you know, um, God's, you know, God's takes a deep breath. God takes a deep breath. 
and forgives, right? And so this is, he's talking about forgiving oneself. And also what's, what's so remarkable in this passage is that, is that, you know, it starts with the individual, Adam, who's like grieving for his own sins and the sins of, of the world around him. But almost the only way to forgive is to recognize that you're connected to the world around you, right? You forgive yourself. And somehow you have to find a way to forgive others, right? Forgiving one's family members, sometimes that's not easy. One's friends, one's generation, one's nation. It's really not easy, I think, frankly, those of us who live in, you know, like we're living through times of like great political conflict. It's not easy to forgive and some, I mean, you can't always do it. I mean, this is me talking, right? But the sense of forgiveness is a kind of like reconciliation. And there's the sense that if you forgive here, you are sort of like opening the channels, opening the sluices of forgiveness into the world and you're enabling and sort of you're forgiving the world is somehow God working through you into the world to come at peace. Now, Rav, now what's striking here is also, this reminds me of like say when Rav Kook talks about a great deal about Avat Yisrael, loving other Jews. And as he says, Avat Yisrael means so I the Torah. Avat Yisrael is, is a large subject in Torah. Like when, when, like, when, so, so, so there, the analogy there is, is like when Rav Kook says like, Avat Yisrael, okay, you want to love all Jews, you actually have to think about how to do it. Right? And he develops these vast philosophical conceptions to figure out what it means to love other Jews, especially when they're behaving so differently from you and behaving in ways that you can't stand, right? And here too, he's not saying, oh, I forgive my, you know, okay, I did something really bad. Oh, okay, I forgive myself. I need to forgive myself on. That's, you know, he's not talking about the kind of thing that one sees in, you know, unconfessional talk shows. So I mean, like a process, because like if forgiveness is about making God present in the world, easily letting yourself off the hook won't do that. Right? And it means, and you can almost you can only forgive by taking some larger picture and trying to see how how do things fit together, how do people relate to one another, how are how have my sins affected other people's lives, or how was I affected by other people's sins? The last text we'll be looking. And this is sort of like almost like a, 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 a summing up of so much of his thinking here. Well, I'll just I'll read the English for the sake of time. We can ask questions now. So. When we forget our own, I use the word subjective because atzmit means like our soul itself, but he also very much means atzmiyut. It's a word he uses a great deal. And he means it as subjectivity in the modern sense, right? Sort of that there's a locus of truth inside of me. And there's, there's, there's a kind of truth that only I can know. When we forget our own subjective soul, when we distract ourselves from looking at our inner lives, and here distracting ourselves from looking at our inner lives is like a pretty good description of how most of us live our lives these days between Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and endless emails and you name it. When we distract ourselves from looking at our inner lives, everything becomes confused and uncertain. And we're not listening anymore. And the main shuva that lights up the darkness in an instant is that one return to oneself, to the roots of one's soul, and immediately return to God, to the soul of all souls, and stride forward up and up in holiness and purity, right? The soul is sort of like the deepest part of oneself, right? And there's this idea that God, one finds it in the Kabbalah and Chassidut, that God is the soul of all souls, right? The idea of the soul is that there's something to us that is deeper, that is richer, that is more true. And that itself comes from God. It means that sort of God is somehow the soul of the soul of the soul. It's like trying to find the deepest truths of ourselves and our place in the human condition and the world. And this is the case with a lone individual, all people, all of humanity, with the restoration of all being, whose ruin always proceeds from forgetting itself. And if it desires to return to God, but isn't prepared to gather its scattered ones, 
right? To the scattered portions of one's soul, the scattered, also like all the kabets need to have, right? That you want to, the soul wants to return, but you can't return to God by lopping off who you are, right? And you can't bring your people, you can't bring humanity back to God by sort of discarding large parts of humanity, right? This is a deceptive tshuva, taking God's name in vain, right? And so only by the great truth of tshuva to oneself will a person and the nation, the world and all the worlds, all of being return to its maker, to light and the light. And that is the secret of the life of Israel. The coming into view of the soul of the world, with whose illumination the world will return to the root of being. And God's life will reveal itself in the And from the source of this great tshuva, man will draw the sacred life force of true tshuva. So this is rather heavy stuff. So tshuva... And again, Rav Kook is not doing, saying all of this by way of discarding halakha. Because, of course, just read his multiple treatises on halakha and, um, and, 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 his, and his, his care for halakhic um, uh, um, uh, 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 practice. Um, but he's talking about frame, putting this in a larger frame. Mona Fishbane points out in, in the chat that extending forgiveness and loving kindness to oneself, one's family, loved ones, and broader and broader concentric circles is similar to the Buddhist loving kindness meta practice. And I think the answer to that, that, that observation is, is, you know, to my mind, obviously correct. I mean, we can, we could talk about, um, you know, Rav Kook was somewhat familiar with Buddhism and he had ideas about it. Um, he, you know, he, he, uh, you know, he didn't care about for Buddhist renunciation of the world, though he thought it was honest. Um, but 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 this notion, and there's, I mean, I mean, it's a subject for a longer conversation, sort of like the, the currents through which different mystical ideas circulate. But yes, um, you know, he's talking about forgiveness. I mean, and for and to, and and this kind of this kind of forgiveness that Rav Kook talks about, forgiving oneself and forgiving one's family and one, um, one's nation, forgiving one's historical epoch, forgiving the world and forgiving all the worlds, which is say like all the multiple dimensions of existence. It's not something you can do in like, you know, an afternoon, I don't think. Um, He's talking about like this is a process that one undertakes, and this idea of returning to oneself. Obviously, again, he's a very idealistic individual. He, um, he, he's he's staking all of this. He's staking all this on a belief that we do have a best self, um, and that there's good inside us, and we can become better. Than we, that that we by becoming so to speak, better than we are, we are becoming truly who we are or who we were meant to be. Now, of course, one can't not know that, um, that, that one, one cannot know that this also seems to have political resonances, right? Um, I mentioned uh, the connections to Rousseau and they can run quite deeply. I mean, Rev Cook is also writing all this in the context of the Jewish return to Zion that the Jewish people's return to the land of Israel is itself part of this process of tshuva. And not simply that they're doing tshuva because like they're doing mitzvot at liyod ba'aretz and they'll start doing tremod and maskrod and hopefully they'll do shemitah and all this kind of stuff. Well, yes, that's obviously true. But he's talking more about this larger historical process. And indeed, like especially when it comes to shemitah, his, his halakhic writings are very much in dialogue with this idea of the, the historical process, processes that are underway in which he's taking part. Um, to swing back to the earlier, to our earlier conversation, conversation earlier today, this is a sort of monologue, I hope you're thinking of something in the conversation. Um, these distinctions between negative and positive liberty. Negative liberty is, so to speak, the liberty of the liberal state, right? It's the job of the state to get out of the way. 
the state is not there to, it's enable you, like, you know, like it says in the American Declaration, life, liberty, the absence of restraint, and the pursuit of happiness. The state is there to enable you to pursue your bliss if you'd like, but it's not meant to be your bliss or it's not meant to provide. That's why Ruf Cook, elsewhere in his writings, and this is one of the more disturbing things in his writings, he very much he denigrates the liberal state. Um, he denigrates the liberal state as, you know, he borrows a line from Ralph Waldo Emerson, that the liberal state is nothing but like a glorified insurance company. But it's not something that will summon people to their greater or better selves. Um, I mean, personally, this is where I, I sort of like part company uh, with, with Ruf Cook. I think it's okay for the state to leave it to leave good enough alone. Um, and, 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 you know, frankly, I think it's very dangerous for the state to take upon itself uh, the task of bringing people to their truest self-fulfillment and that the state being, you know, the locus of realization of one's own, one's own, own deepest um, self-fulfillment. And that's something we could, we could, we could talk about um, at length. But I think that's so much of the challenge with Ruf Cook, especially because here in Israel, of course, his writings are very political, or they're taken in very political ways. And these very Rousseauian ideas of, um, of, of the will uh, fuel uh, you know, political movements, actors um, here in Israel to talk about, you know, like, well, we understand the will of the people better than others, and, and we'll take it upon ourselves to educate the people on what their will ought to be. So, so as you can tell, you know, like this for a long time, there's a lot of, a lot of me personally speaking, that like I'm deeply in love with Rick Cooking's teachings. And at the same time, um, it's like as it is with any thinker uh, to sort of take a look and see like what are these remarkable ways in which he revitalizes our religious conception, our religious vocabulary, our religious concepts, and thus reshapes our sense of who we are and what we are doing as human beings. Um, and yet, how does that relate? To, 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 to all the various sectors of, of life and how do, we, um, how do we understand this in light of other and, and different uh, conflicting teachings and approaches to Chula. I mean, one of the beauties of Rip Cook's approach is that he was very much about celebrating other points of view, including other approaches to this question of Chula, even as we've um, tried to uh, uh, present, present um, their own. Um, so we have time for, for a few questions. I see in the chat, um, um, uh, one, one, uh, so, um, Annie Gourmet asks, I talked about sparks of light. Is that in a way like Heschel's ideas? Um, well, yes. I mean, obviously, you know, Rob Cook and, and, uh, Rabbi Heschel are make for a really interesting comparison, uh, because there's great similarities between them. Um, there's also some genuine differences and, and in some ways, like, and, and the comparison is kind of illuminating. I mean, if you take a look at, I mean, in some ways, you know, it's something I, I regularly tell people, if you want to get a quick handle on differences in like fundamental approaches to Jewish theology between America and Israel, um, a great way to begin is just to sort of start with the observation that um, for American religious thinkers, um, the key religious thing, you know, for, for, for you know, for traditional minded uh, religious thinkers, the key thinkers are, are Joseph, uh, Rabbi Salvatore and Rabbi Heschel, and in Israel, it's Rav Kook, um, who is a, um, who, who, right, and, and sort of even, I mean, we can leave Rev Salvechik uh, for, for, for another time, but the comparisons with, with Rabbi Heschel, um, the ecstatic language, um, the ways in which I think, I think you would agree by now that in reading Rav Kook, um, or I think, I wonder if you would agree with me that in reading Rav Kook, the literary force and power of how he's expressing himself is 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 no less a piece of the package than the actual ideas that he's putting um, that he's that he's putting that he's putting forth, um, and and at the same time, so we're getting to the specific question of sparks. He's less interested. Rabbi Heschel is much more of a Hasidic thinker, and so talks a lot more about sparks. Um, Rav Kook is aware of Hasidic thought and draws on Hasidic thought, but he doesn't talk about raising sparks as much as letting light grow. Uh, let, letting life flow. I know that that look is cutting the distinctions a little thin, but but it's 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 I think a, a meaningful difference. Um, and finally, uh, Mona Pishbein asks, um, does Rav Cook think we return to a good self that's already formed? We return to a kernel of goodness that needs to be developed um, or refined. 
That's a wonderful question. And characteristically for him, I think the answer would somehow be both. That um, the goodness is somehow already there in, in potentio, um, but it needs to be like worked through and it needs to be developed. And um, it becomes developed in part through like the clashes of opposites, through throwing oneself um, against against um, this world. Um, again, it's, it's, it's this, this sense that, I mean, just to use like straightforward Kabbalistic imagery, right? You know, there's the river that flows from Eden and it has the multiple, 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 multiple tributaries, right? And then sooner or later it all returns and flows into the sea and then flows back to Eden. So on the one hand, um, on the, in the one in the one hand, it's all there, like sort of the first, in some sense, the first bit of flow out of Eden. It's all right there, and it's returning to the source. And at the same time, as as the tributaries are sort of breaking ground and expanding outward, um, they are doing new things and they are fertilizing new ground and making possible new kinds of growth that, in some sense, was already present in potentia at the beginning but needed to come to fruition in order for it actually to return. And because Rav Kook is a Judaic thing, because this also gets to a lot of his polemic of Christianity, he very much affirms the body, right? Kodesh has to proceed from Chol. That's part of why Halakha is very important to him. There's a lot of reasons why, but it's one of like, things have to be embodied, right? You know, you can't transcend body and soul. You can't, you know, like, the body cannot be spiritualized if it doesn't proceed through itself. Right. Um, so, so um, Mona, I don't know if that 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 answers your question, but I think I think that helps 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 um, helps, helps clarify. Maybe I hope it helps clarify a little. Um, Rabbi Kelman, are we are we doing okay? Are we out of time? I think we're doing okay. It's twelve oh one, so I think we can wrap up unless there's any somebody has a question that'd like to pop in a quick question. We'll be happy. To right, right. And I'm sorry for going dark. I should have I should have turned on the light. Um, That's here. okay. It's like watching a movie. You know, you're supposed to watch in the dark. <laughs> yeah, whether it's a whether it's the a dark and the likeness. We have Rob Cook. We've got to let in the likeness to the dark. Right, right, we have to right. start with the dark after Yom Kippur. Who can be light or our show or what have you? Right. Okay, I want to really thank you for. Well, I don't thank you all. Cool, very much.